Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Are you ready for eternity? Can you face Jesus, the King of Kings, upon his return? Do you know the pathway to everlasting life? Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Now, Heavenly Father, we come to you asking this day that the word that goes forth would be anointed as it always is. But Lord, this old preacher needs your strength, your help, and your anointing. We ask you to help us through this in a glorious and wonderful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today we're going to talk about something a lot of people are familiar with. It's called baptism. And it's amazing how many people there are that uh, claim they've been baptized, don't even know what it means, don't even understand why I would make such a remark. Well, the title today is, Have You Really Been Baptized? Well, why do I need to be baptized? Well, because we were told in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38, uh, when Peter was asked the question, uh, What shall we do to be saved? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Wow! Now that answers a lot of questions. We find that there are many organizations today that call themselves Christian. And as we pick up the thought in Romans chapter 6 verse 1, uh, we read these words. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well now, what kind of a question is that, uh, just starting off at the beginning of a chapter? Well, you remember that we talked about the fifth chapter uh, last uh, week, I think, and, and uh, we discovered that there are some things that we needed to remember. And uh, then we find that as we just read the scriptures that we need to be baptized, and in order to do that, we need to repent and be baptized. And uh, the repentance, you notice, is ordered before the baptism. Well, why is that? Well, it's because your determination that you're going to change your longing to satisfy the carnality of your flesh and all of the uh, ideas and, and evil things and ungodly things that uh, we put the flesh through, or the, uh, maybe I should say the flesh puts us through, because the real person in our body is the spirit of the breath that God gives us, and he gave unto Adam as he created Adam and breathed into his nostrils, and he became a living soul. So our body can be destroyed, consumed, whatever happens to it uh, just can be evaporated into the air, uh, but it has not changed ourselves, our life. Our spirit cannot be destroyed. It is a spirit that lives within us that is our being, our personality, the very life itself that enables our body to respond to what we dictate for it to do. And uh, we respond to what the spirit within us leads us to uh, believe or to act upon a certain uh, desire or effort or whatever situation might call for. And so we need to understand that when Adam sinned, and I know I say this constantly, but there are people that don't yet know this, have not yet heard this. And so when Adam sinned, God said, if you violate these, or this order, stay away from that tree, that fruit. If you'll do that, you're going to have a long life. 
He's going to be uh, really in charge of all God created. And he's going to have the ability to rule over all of God's creation. And so what happened? He didn't obey God. And God said, if you disobey, you'll surely die. That, mean, that word means surely, and I've said this many times, but the word surely means it is of an absolute unwavering truth that you will die. Now, quick, instantly. Oh, well, you know, I've told you before, Adam didn't die physically. No, but the spirit within him did. And it became a spirit that was still indestructible, but it was not undefilable. And when it became undefiled, it lost its communion and connection and fellowship with the, the God who gave it to each of us. And that breath that comes within us when we are born is a breath that is still quickened by Almighty God in us, or we would have a dormant, inactive, incomplete, empty vessel in which to live, and we would have no worth whatsoever because we could not determine, decide, put forth effort, uh, do and eat and and experience and come into a place where we have some sort of participation in the world in one way or another. But the problem is that when Adam died spiritually, he could not pass on the spirit uh, spiritually that was untarnished by uh, conceiving a child through his wife. So, for many years, Bible says there was no law from Adam until Moses. And all that period of time, men, and uh, I say men because when we talk about man, we need to remember that man means just what it says, man. It means mankind. God said when he created Adam and came to the conclusion after Adam had blown it, missed it, died spiritually, that Adam needed some help. And so he took, uh, the Bible tells us, the rib from uh, Adam, used it, and from it ordered it to become uh, Eve, and from that rib, Adam's flesh, Adam's flesh, not his spirit, Adam's flesh, but the spirit was gone from Adam's flesh, the righteous spirit that God had planted in him when he became a living soul. Now his soul is inactive, dead. It's somehow or another impossible for him to have fellowship and communion with the Creator that made him because he has disobeyed and the Spirit that God gave him that was pure, holy, beautiful, wonderful, had the capacity to name all of the animals, all the creation of the world, and was given the power and the authority to rule over everything that included the firmament, the stars, the sun, the air between, now the sky above, the clouds, everything that is here, God created. But it was contaminated with sin. And so we have mankind. Mankind because man represented Adam. Mankind represented from Adam, which Eve was made and formed and created by God. When we go then to uh, repent and be baptized, as Peter declares in the book of Acts, by the way, this happened right after uh, the uh, power of the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and the followers of the Lord in the upper room, and uh, 
uh, they were anointed and filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ had told them when he ascended into the heavens, I think I touched on this last week, uh, that he left the Holy Spirit here to be with us and to guide, direct, and help us. And thank God we have him. When we come to the place where we say, Lord, I'm empty. I don't like what I am. I don't know what to do the things I do. I realize because of the presence of your spirit that is around about me that uh, I realize that I, I don't have communion with the spirit. I don't have ability to understand the spirit. I don't have the ability to really talk to you or hear from you. I know he's there. The spirit is there. I see evidence of that in a lot of different ways. But Lord, I don't have what I want. And then you have to come to the place where you listen to Peter's words when he said, you need to be repentant and you need to be baptized, every one of you that was man and woman, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost is those of us who serve the Lord as Christians, even though we aren't really aware or tutored on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, we do know that the Holy Spirit was left with us that he might draw us unto God. But as we go on in our study, we now find that we have to deal with some real absolutes that Jesus said was required. Jesus was the first one to say, you must be born again or you won't even be able to see the kingdom of God, let alone become a part of it. Something to really think about. So now, uh, in Romans, after hearing these things, you might ask yourself, well then, what shall we say then? What do we do? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. Paul comes along and he says unto them, You claim you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Redeemer, but you're still living like the devil. You're not living for God. You're living in the same way you lived before you claim Christ as your Lord. Now, if you believe on Christ Jesus, you have to believe that his word was given unto you to instruct you, and it was absolute truth. It was a covenant between you and God Almighty when you accepted the Lord and obeyed, believed. You can't disobey and believe. If you believe God gives a directive, and you don't think it's important, you've denied his word, you've re rejected the gift that was offered unto you at the presence of the Holy Spirit drawing you in to a place where you could hear the truth that was given unto you by the scripture, the word, the directives that was given unto the disciples. So now, Paul comes along and he says, hey, you missed it. You didn't hear what you were supposed to do and be. And so, again, he says, what shall we say then? Are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, they already said or knew or learned that if they obeyed the command of the Lord, uh, that the grace of God was going to be with them and that they were going to have the meaning of the word grace become uh, their gift from God. Well, what's the meaning of grace? The meaning of grace is absolute certainty that uh, you will respond to what you know is the truth. 
If you don't respond to it and keep living in your sin, then you've denied what you have just been offered by the Lord, but you have denied it by your rejection of obedience. Belief requires obedience. If you believe that God meant what he said, then what he said to do, you will do. If you don't do it, you're denying it, and you are not being obedient, and therefore you are not really believing. So what I'm trying to get through to you is that if you really believe, you're going to do what the Lord said to do, and you're going to live as the Lord said for you to live. They were not doing that. And so Paul says, what are you up to here? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? You have to understand that grace isn't applicable if you're living in sin. Though the mercy of God may be long-suffering for a long time and let you continue in the way you choose to live before you finally come to Him. And if you don't finally come to Him and believe and come to the place where you can receive the grace of God and the mercy of God in its fullness, you're going to miss out. You won't have any part in the kingdom of God for eternity. You'll rather be condemned to uh, the judgment of condemnation. That's the fruit of sin. And so we go now into verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're not dead to sin because you don't believe it matters. If you believed it matters, you would do what Jesus said for you to do. And so Paul says, God forbid that you continue in this way of life. Oh, they were teaching, and by the way, uh, that particular organization, which became an organization after this fact, some 300 years later, but uh, that same organization is still talking about, and that's why Pastor Applegate always tells you, if you are a Christian, if you are becoming a Christian, if you are going through the motions of a obedience, first of all, if just a sprinkle on a little baby's face means absolutely zero. Nothing. And so if you believe as you were, quote, baptized that way, number one, you were not baptized at all. Number two, that method of baptism is not baptism and has no power. And so you continue to have the battle that goes on in your spirit because you want to be what God wants you to be. You ask God to help you to be that. And then we go on and we get instruction in the Word and we find out, well, I have to change my way of living. I have to reject sin. But I can't. That's hard to do. No, it's not hard to do. If you believe, God will give you the anointing of His truth in His Word as you obey and are baptized. And then as you come up out of the water and you really come out, I've seen people baptized by the hundreds, thousands, down through the years I've ministered. And I've seen people come out of the water and there's a glow on their face and there's a shout in their voice and they're raising their hands and praising the Lord. Why? Because they were baptized. And the Spirit of God broke the bondage of the law of sin and death and gave them the ability to repent. But you see, the old devil got his way with Adam. And he wants to have his way with you. And so he's going to lie to you. He's going to give you all kinds of false doctrine. He's going to uh, pretend to be your friend. He'll tell you that he'll prosper you. And he can. He'll tell you that he'll keep you happy. 
He'll keep your flesh happy, but he can never satisfy your spirit. And on and on it goes. The devil has only one method of operation. That's lying and deceiving and always extending a falsehood to shatter the truth that might be taken literally as truth. God forbid, how shall we, that we are dead to sin. Well, how did I become dead to sin? You became dead to sin when the blood of Jesus Christ was accepted for your redemption and for your atonement. Well, your redemption is buying you back from the grips of Satan and giving you the ability to be free from his demands. If you don't have the help of God and the righteousness of the Lord within you, you're not going to be able to withstand the demands of Satan and the lies of Satan and all of the pain and anguish that comes of, of what he promises you. Oh, you'll have a season of excitement. You'll have a season of fun. You'll have a season where you think all is well. Oh, what a great thing it is to be alive. And then all at once, suddenly, the fruit of sin has not left you. Why? Because you denied the truth of God's redemption, of the Lord's buying you back from the grips of Satan, of setting you free and giving you authority. God gave his people the ability to tell Satan, you will not, cannot have any place in my life. Now get out of here and leave me alone. You have that authority and that power. And Satan has to flee. He has to go. Oh, he'll come back again and he'll see if you really meant that. And you'll be tested and you'll be tried. But the Holy Spirit will always be there. And uh, that spirit that was ruling you, which was the evil, ungodly, immoral spirit that's filled with all of the deceptions and the longing of a carnal flesh. You see, the flesh don't want to be ruled by you. It doesn't want to have to obey you. Why? Because the flesh was getting its satisfaction from the works of Satan. But you see, when God delivered you and re you were redeemed through the blood of Christ, brought back into the kingdom of God, brought to a state of purity spiritually, when that happened, you were given the ability to rule over Satan instead of allowing Satan to rule over you. Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? Nope, it won't work that way. Now verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Why do you have to be baptized in water and immersed in water? So that you understand that you have been set free from the powers of hell. Your flesh is still subject. But your flesh now has to come into submission to what you say it can do rather than what it oftentimes wants to do. We become dead to sin. Dead to sin. You mean, Pastor, that when I am baptized and I determine that I'm going to keep the Word of God and live as Jesus and the Apostles tell us that we're supposed to live, that when I determine to do that, that I have the power to get rid of Satan and his constant hounding me and trying to tempt me and get me to do those things that I already knew were wrong before I even heard about Jesus. I knew it wasn't right, but I couldn't help it. But now you see, you have become, when you're baptized, put under the water, held there for a few seconds, and then lifted out, 
and as you lift it out, water comes off of your forehead, off of your head first, down over your face, your shoulders, and there you are. You're wet all over and still in the lake or the water baptistry or whatever, wherever the water may be. But you have been baptized and you have been cut off from Satan's rule. He cannot rule you unless you let him. And of course your body is going to cry out because it still has the old carnal nature of destruction and evil that it thrived on until you met the Lord and claimed him as your Redeemer. Verse number four. Therefore we are buried with him. You get the picture? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. You have to be baptized to have the fullness of the benefits of God's redemption. Until then, Satan can still rule you. For if, for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. You see, Satan don't want you to be baptized. He wants you to have all kinds of excuses and different forms that are called baptism, but they are not, and they're lies, and so what? Knowing this, that our old man, that's the one that was sinful, that could not live righteously, had no ability to say no to the devil, and uh, had to do all of his fighting against evil in his own strength. And now man has been set free when he came to the place where he asked God to forgive him. He did that when he repented. But repentance wasn't activi activated until he began to live free and he was severed from his walk with Satan being dominated and uh, maligned and all kinds of torment put upon by the actions of satanic powers, demonic beings, the forces of darkness and evil of every dimension, immorality that you cannot even begin to speak of. It's so terrible. And so, he said, we know this, that our old man is crucified with him. Well, Jesus, when he was crucified, had a pure body, a pure blood, a pure spirit, everything about him was pure, and when he was put to death, that spirit had not sinned, and it had not died, but the body that it was in, the powers of hell that ruled that body, had come into subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, from now on, in other words, we should not serve sin. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand how hard that is. It's only hard when you come to the place that you don't really understand what the Lord Jesus Christ was telling you. Well, what was he telling us? You must be born again. You have to be born again. Well, Satan says, ha, ha, ha. You aren't going to believe that one, are you? Who can enter into their mother's womb again and then come forth? That's too late for that. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. But you see, what died was the spirit of righteousness, the spirit of wholeness, the spirit that God gave 
unto Adam before Adam contaminated it and killed it with disobedience and rebellion. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Do you believe that? Then why are you still sinning? Now I've asked people many times, and I've had people make a commitment unto the Lord, and they uh, don't follow through with baptism, and they don't read their word, the word, they don't fellowship with fellow Christians, and they continue to live their life just like they always did, and they uh, expect somehow or another that that doesn't matter. And so they go to their priest or to their pastor or to their whatever their so-called spiritual leader is called and say, I don't understand. This is happening. This is happening. I thought that would be gone when I accepted Jesus as Lord. Oh, no, no, my friend. You're still living here on this imperfect earth. You have to sin. In fact, I've had people look me straight in the face and they weren't trying to spoof me or put me in some sort of torment. They were looking me in the face with all sobriety and say, Pastor, I know this. The Bible says we have to sin a little bit every day. Where'd you learn that? You didn't learn it from the Word of God. The Word of God says, when you accept my deliverance that is given unto you from, through the work of the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God that was slaughtered for your sin, that you might receive the grace and the, and the wonderful uh, love and hope and promise, covenant that I have for you. But you didn't want to do that. And so you'll go to the next one and that someone tells you that, and you'll go to the next one and you'll say to them the same thing. Well, what do you find? They'll say, they'll put their arm around you, probably this arm, and they'll put it around you and they'll say, oh, listen, brother, listen, sister, you're living in the world. This is a world filled with all kinds of problems. You don't need to worry about that. God loves you. Didn't he call you and tell you to accept him? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. You'll be fine. And so you live in your sin until you die. And when you get ready to come before the throne of God, there is no throne there. Because you, you're not directed there. You're directed to Hades, or hell, or whatever you want to name it. Because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that set you free has been rejected by your unwillingness to accept the redemptive covenant that he paid for in your behalf. And that's why you may have a very active body. It may be very wholesome and, and powerful and healthy and, and you enjoy it to, uh, to a great deal in a lot of ways. But you see, it isn't long until no matter how you try, you're going to be placed in a position where you have to compromise your commitment to the Lord and the Holy Spirit's roundabout. He's going to convict you. He's going to say, now, he even knows your name. So he's going to say, hey, blank, 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 you. What, what does that mean? Well, I wanted to say a name, but if I say a name, there's so many people out there that are named with uh, uh, this world's names that... Uh, I thought, well, I'll try to explain this a different way. So anyway, we make the decision that we don't have to be too careful about how we live. We can let the old carnal flesh enjoy itself. Well, there's lots of ways that we can enjoy the body we live in and still keep it free from the bondage of the law of sin and death. 
and that is by abiding by the Word of God given unto us by the Lord Jesus Himself. He told us what to do, and then He sent the Holy Spirit to equip us with the power to do it on the day of Pentecost. And now we find that uh, He has nine glorious gifts, one of which anyone who has been born again into His kingdom have some possession to. They may not know it, but they do. But the thing of it is, they may have a lot of the gifts powerful in their life. They may have only one or two. But they have one or two or three. They have whatever you need. Let me put it this way. You have whatever you need from God through the application of the Holy Spirit applying the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember, when you went under the water, it represents his death. When you come up out of the water, it represents his life. And so, it represents your freedom from the law and bondage that you cannot break on your own in your carnal body. But it sets your body free with the help of the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says, He that is dead is freed from sin. Well, your soul that was in such corruption and problem and needed so much help and brought you to a point of desperation perhaps, the power of that spirit within you, no, I'm not saying you're demon-possessed. I'm saying the spirit that you inherited from your parent, male parent, because you've lived with that from the time you were born until the time that you entered into repentance. That means, Lord, I'm guilty. I know I need to change. And then, baptism. I want you to understand. Instead of Satan playing you like a fiddle, or bouncing you around like a ping pong ball, lying to you and deceiving you and, and causing you trouble after trouble and pain after pain and anguish after anguish, his power is broken. If you really repent and get baptized, but only baptism there is no baptism, let me put it this way. There is no baptism unless you are submerged under water, held there for a few seconds, and then somebody lifts you out of the water, and you can come up, and you can have that glow on your face, the radiance in your countenance is beautiful. The glint in your eye is bright and, and your eye is sparkling with insight and vision and seeing things in a way you never saw before. And you have severed the power of Satan over you. But if you are going to settle for what Satan has to offer as baptism, you're just falling into his grip more firmly, even though you claim that you believe Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Redeemer. In your heart you know that that's what you thought you wanted and did want, but you also know that you don't have it. You know the Holy Spirit is around about us, everywhere present. For he that is dead, that means dead from sin, is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. 
You know, sometimes I get this temptation that comes my way from the enemy. He comes and he tries to hassle us. He either gets uh, hassling myself or maybe one of the children or all of the children, maybe the whole family or maybe my wife and somebody has to take charge because he is such a smooth liar that he will have you believing that you've done everything you need to do. No. Jesus said, number one, you must be born again. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. I'm going to read verse 7 again. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now that word believe again means I'm absolutely convinced of truth. There's no doubt in my mind that Jesus kept his word. I knew when Jesus gave me deliverance that I, my sin that I'd lived under for so long. I understood that. And, uh, and now, well, again, I'm telling you that it is important to follow through with what Jesus said to do. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Verse 10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Come to the realization that if you really believe that Jesus died for you and you were baptized and asked God to uh, cleanse you and redeem you, you need to know that you were at that moment severed, cut away from any control the enemy has over you. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. You have power over it. But I want to go back to the book of Isaiah. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. Father, as we take of this bread, we recognize the terrible price that Jesus paid, that we might be set free from a mortal body that is subject to destruction, hurt, pain, all kinds of maladies. And yet, Lord, as we take this bread, we're reminded that Jesus took the stripes on the whipping post for all those things that are customary in the body that is carnal. And so with that, I ask you, can you turn your life over to Jesus? What are you going to do with him? As we eat this bread, he paid the total price to give you all authority and power to rule your own body and to live a holy life, and to send the Satan scampering with his tail between his legs. With that thought, let us eat together.
has rejected the cup represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It represents blood that literally absorbed his directives. We take this saying, Lord, I know. I know the awful pain that you bore. But Lord, when I read the scripture and I find that he took not only my sin, but the sin of anybody in the world, all down through the centuries, he took the sin that they had if they would come to him and keep his word. And when I think about him taking the load, the burden, the terrible agony of the sin of everybody who would dare to believe upon him, I can't help but have pain and tears come to my eyes because he bore it all. He went through it all for any of us who will just take the gift that he gave us. The power to say no to sin. And so as we drink of it, Lord, we want to thank you and I can't imagine the agony that you went through. But I know you went through without yielding. I know you came through victorious. And just as you were raised from the dead by the Father, we're going to be raised by the dead as you were. When that day comes that we join you in your kingdom here on this earth. Praise your wonderful name. Thank you, Lord. Let us drink together. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene at Gene, with a G-E-N-E, Gene at ChristianLiving101.org.